Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 33. My name is Jay Ozan, I'm the host of this show, and today we have on uh, Atul Wankade and Julie Wu Finkelstein, and they'll introduce themselves once I finish my intro here. Uh, I'm based out of uh, Hazlitt, uh, New Jersey, which is approximately 50 miles away from uh, New York uh, City. And uh, I, I do three things. One is uh, I coach uh, people who have to give uh, high stakes uh, speeches. Uh, second is I mentor uh, this Coursera course called Introduction to Public Speaking. So I mentor students all over the world. And the third thing that I'm currently working on is uh, a book on public speaking, uh, which will go into my journey to become a, I call it, good to great uh, speaker. Uh, so those are the three things that I'm primarily focusing on right now. And uh, one of the things that uh, we do on this show is that we are loosely affiliated with the Coursera course. And this is kind of uh, <coughs> our opportunity to discuss uh, different speech topics. We review speeches. So the focus is primarily on speaking, not necessarily public speaking. It could be, you know, conversation. Because we think like every time you are speaking, it, it's it's public, right? So, so the thing I always like to say, there's no such thing as public uh, speaking. It's good speaking, bad speaking, and if you decide, no speaking. So, one of the things we do is uh, we have a, a learning uh, community on Google uh, Plus that that we created a while back, and we use that as a way to uh, uh, you know, learn, uh, teach, in fact, uh, you know, mentor, share, and it's a support group. So this is uh, an opportunity for people to come on uh, if they feel comfortable. You know, we don't force anybody to come on this uh, show and uh, discuss uh, various speech topics because uh, public speaking, I believe, is one of those things you just don't do it, learn about it when you suddenly are faced with giving a speech, you should be doing it every day because we speak every day. So today's uh, show is going to be, uh, we're just going to have discussion on uh, three topics. And the way the show is going to go today is uh, once I'm done with my intro, I will have Julie and Atul do a quick intro. And then we move into what I call as a three minute speech segment. And this is sort of like a freestyle where you take any topic you want to discuss and you have three minutes. You don't time anybody here, but try to keep it close to three minutes if you can and just see how it goes. This is your opportunity. Uh, it's our opportunity to practice. And then we're going to talk about, then we move into the show, the three segments. And like I said, these are discussion topics. The first one is, uh, it's a general topic. like. Why do people, uh, you know, I call it, you know, suck at public speaking? So I recorded a video that I've included that uh, hope uh, Atul and uh, Julie had a chance to view it. And this is sort of, I want to get their input into it. This is a discussion. And I think there are three things. Uh, there could be many, but these are the three main things I've come up with. Uh, fear, time, and method. So we'll have a discussion on that. The second topic is, uh, and again, this is an important topic, is feedback. This is, again, a topic, it's a recurring topic that keeps coming up. And feedback is very important because you need feedback. And I'm using this kind of a, a, an analogy here on how to give feedback. And I use an analogy of an optometrist. And we'll have a discussion on that. I'll go into it in more detail. And then the third one is uh, kind of a little controversial on what makes a good speech, right? Because when you're on a stage and you're speaking, you have some belief. And sometimes you don't want to try to appeal to everybody. You want to find out who are the ones that are going to really like the message that you're giving. And you can't tar target everybody, otherwise that's not going to work. So I call it that you need to think about being a little delusional when you're speaking. Like, you know, there are certain things you're going to say that other people out there are not going to agree with, but you've got to say it anyway. And be in that position. You've got to be ready to do that if you want to come across as a kind of a powerful speaker. And so we'll have a discussion on that. We'd like to know what Atul and uh, Julie have to say about that. So that's the show for today. 
And uh, at this point, I'd like uh, Julie uh, first and then Atul to do a quick intro, and then we'll move into our three-minute uh, segment. Uh, Julie? Hey, good morning, you guys. Good morning, Atu and Jay. And I see both of you are in dark today, and you're both wearing glasses. So I at least have some dark on, but I don't have my shades on. So I'm not as cool as you guys. But uh, I'm Julie Wu Finkel Singer, Jay says. I grew up in Hong Kong, moved to Canada, and I had my career in, uh, I actually have had two careers, one in IT, and the other one I was um, a body worker healer. So right now my goal is to um, using both the system techniques, the management techniques, business techniques, and my body mind techniques to link the vision into action in the sense that a lot of some people are vision oriented, they have lots of dreams and the other some people are like just very active and high energy level but I think the bridge between the two makes a lot of interesting things happen. So right now I have two workshops for free um, that I do to facilitate that and also I facilitate uh, two online forums. Uh, one is for public speaking success and the other one is just um, uncovering our own already existing success. Um, today, so that's what I'm going to do and I have several speeches I like to do. I, I see that today I'm doing a, um, a, a sharing a method of how to stretch and then um, I would like to talk about creating a binder for the map of your life the you know, universe and then my future speeches will include using meditation for problem solving and opportunity seeking and then um, another speech is the vision action life cycle that I'm developing so thank you Okay, great, Julie. Atul? Hi, Julie. Hi, Jay. And hi, folks uh, there. Um, I'm Atul Wankare. I'm uh, based off Bellevue, which is like 20 miles from Seattle. Uh, I work as a software engineer in travel industry. Um, I have, uh, I've come from India and been here in state for a few years now. Uh, apart from work, uh, I spend most of my time playing with kids and uh, running around behind him and um, I'm expe expecting one more kid so I'm like really excited <laughs> so next um, on March is the due date so I'm looking forward for it and hopefully I get time after uh, uh, running behind the other kid and handling the other one little one so I'm yeah, excited thanks it's for myself. Oh, uh, congratulations so you have a, a, a son or a daughter right now uh, I have a son right now. And the uh, next one is going to be? A daughter. <laughs> All right. There you go. One of each. <laughs> that's you. what I have, a son and a daughter. So. Oh, nice. Well, that's good. All right. Congratulations to you and your, and your wife. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, uh, we will move into our three-minute uh, uh, speech segment. So I'll go first. So I'll take a pause here first. Okay. Okay, welcome back. Welcome to Speech Talk Live, uh, episode number 33, and uh, we're going to uh, do our three-minute uh, speech segment where um, each of us has roughly three minutes to give a, a speech on any topic that uh, that we choose. So I'll, I'll start first. So I want to talk about something that happened uh, in uh, the East Coast that I think many of you are probably uh, f uh, aware of, which is that we had a storm. I think the storm was named Jonas. I don't know how they come up with this name, but hey, that's what they named it, Jonas. And uh, it took, it happened last Saturday, and we got close to two feet of snow. They were predicting, the, the meteorologists were predicting about eight inches, and it turned into almost more than two feet. And with drifts, it was even more difficult. So on Sunday, I go out and start shoveling, try to create a path uh, to the to, to the to the uh, road, so that at least I can go out and you know just feel like at least I have a path to to the outside world. 
And then these, uh, there were these uh, pickup truck came, and there, were th there was a guy there, the driver says, hey, uh, do you want your uh, driveway and uh, the, the sidewalk uh, cleared? And um, I was, like, thinking about it, and I said, um, hmm. I said, but, uh, like I said, how much, how much uh, do you charge? How much are you going to charge? He said, well, about $100. So I said, uh, but, but wait a second. I said, but you don't even have a snowblower. Uh, there's a lot of snow here. How are you going to do it? He said, oh, but I got, like, you know, total four guys here, so we can get it done pretty quickly. I said, no, nah, I don't want you to do it because uh, if you got four people, if that's what you're going to do, I think we have them too. Of course, in my case, I have my, my two kids and my wife. And they don't know this yet, okay? So I said, no. I said, last time I had this guy, uh, they had like three people, and they had a snowblower and some other equipment, and they did it for $50. So I said, no, I'm going to pass on it. So they left. Okay, so then my son came out, and then my daughter came out, and they started shoveling. And uh, then a little while later, my wife came out, and she started complaining. Said, And I, like an idiot, told her, I said, oh, by the way, there were these guys uh, who came and they were going to do it for $100 and she started like, so why did you not take it? Uh, you know, you're in no position to do uh, shovel the snow, it's like two feet, are you crazy? And you know, we have three cars we have to get out because I also take my parents' car and we put it in our driveway. So she was not too happy and you know, she was like constantly complaining that you should have, you should have gotten those guys to do it. This was just ridiculous. So we started shoveling, and to make the story short, uh, we ended up clearing out the the driveway and also the, the sidewalk. And it, it was hard, but I think I learned something important uh, there. And I think you can do this with the first snowstorm. I'm not sure it's possible after that. That it, it felt good. You know, it felt good in a sense that it... It was like we don't get a chance as a family to do a lot of things together, and this was sort of our way to really like work together doing something which was difficult, which was to clear out an entire driveway and the sidewalk. And the snow was really like uh, near the road; it's really compacted, and I think it brought us a lot closer because it felt like we achieved something. You know, this was a major snowstorm. We were out there for like more than an hour clearing out the driveway. So even though a lot of people out there were complaining about the snow and this and that, I now I look at it, and I know my wife at that time, I don't know if she's gotten over it, but then I, I said, listen, this snow, there was like a good thing that came out of it. How often do we actually go out and work together as a family, try to you know, defeat something <laughs> that was all, you know, that, that, that was pretty, pretty tough. And, uh, you know, we were sore, everybody was tired, we all had a good night's sleep, but I thought that uh, next time when you have a snowstorm, don't look at it as a, oh my God, what am I going to do? Go out and get your whole family out, and who knows, it'll bring you guys uh, closer together. So there is something good that came out of that storm. But don't tell that to my wife. All right, Julie. Thank you. So you took the family on the hero's journey, like uh, Joseph Campbell says. So you should tell her about that. <laughs> You're all heroes now. Thank you. Excuse me. <coughs> Hi, uh, Julie again. So thank you. Today, um, as I said earlier, I want to uh, share with you a book I'm writing. And it's going to be actually more like a booklet. Um, and uh, this was uh, validated um, by a recent Google talk by this uh, genius called David Patterson. Is do small. It's better to do three small projects or ten small projects than one big project because he says the amount of learning it correlates with um, how many projects not you do, not how many, not how big a project you do. So that was very interesting. Anyways, I have learned um, these 10 stretches, and I'm a professional body practitioner in several, in several fields. But this one was from this um, uh, Zen teacher, body worker practitioner called Everett Ogawa. And he's, he practiced um, a, a structure 10 sessions uh, that um, 
takes the base of Ida Rose's work and add the Moshe Feldenkrais work. And I'll go back and explain these terms and then add the emotional techniques. So for me, the, the um, Jay made me say that I have to say one word for my purpose of this book. So the purpose of this book is the stairs because it lets you start where you are and lets you get to where you want to go. So to me, in any human endeavor, um, we start off with a lot of um, pain and doubt. You know, life's a bitch. <laughs> so, uh, but then somewhere you get to, if you continue this evolution, you, you want things and you get things and then you want more things and you get more things and to me that's success. You can, you have the power to succeed. And then, believe it or not, at some point you realize that all that success is not satisfying because there's something else going on, something a little deeper. Maybe who you are, maybe the meaning of your existence, right? So I call these three stages. First thing is health. You have to have good health. The second stage is energy and power. You need to have physical power, mental power, concentration to succeed. And the third one is serenity, happiness, or enlightenment. Now, it's not that you don't have any of this along the way. All three things go on, but the proportions change. So uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to time myself. How many more minutes do I have? I can't hear you. Can you use your finger? You can start, yeah, you can start wrapping up another 30 seconds. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, so these stretches are really powerful. And I really like the idea that it's something that's your friend for your whole life because it supports you. And that's a word, support or bridge. Um, I have, if I have more time, I will explain why it's so great. But I, I would just say that it combines the Eastern wisdoms with the Western knowledge. So Ida Rolf is a, was a chemist professor in Columbia University. And, and she, she brought in a lot of the structural work, uh, intelligence. And then Moshe Feldenkrais was a PhD physics teacher, uh, a researcher for the Israeli government. On top of that, he also has a ninth degree black belt, and he teaches uh, defense. He's dead now. He taught um, defense to the French government and to the Israeli government. So out of that came a lot of Western techniques and Western wisdom. And then the teacher, Everett's teacher was Dable. He studied with Ida, personally, Moshe, and many other Western teachers. And then he discovered um, this Zen center called Chozanji, which is in Hawaii, uh, and was a teacher was a martial art master, and that was how he attained enlightenment through the martial arts path. So he understand power, energy, and putting that into life. And so this is all about um, using all the techniques of East and West, but it's simple and it's easy to get started with. So I invite you to find out more about it by emailing me at juliecow999 at gmail.com. And I'll be giving away free books in a month or so as a beta version. So um, you can get a free book if you give me feedback. So thank you. OK, excellent. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> at some point, we'd like a length, longer version of this speech. I think you're working on that, right? So right. All right, Atul. Yeah. <clears throat> so th yeah, that was great speech, uh, Julie and uh, and Jay as well. I yeah, I kind of like the idea. Uh, family time, it's good. It's good one. Um, so today, uh, so I've uh, I'm volunteering for uh, Hackathon, which is uh, organized by Expedia, uh, and going to share some things on it. Uh, so Expedia is hosting a hackathon at uh, University of Washington, Seattle here over this weekend. In fact, it's uh, going to start at today evening uh, uh, around 5.30. Uh, generally, uh, so this hackathon is basically 
Expedia has a bunch of APIs around car search, hotel search, hotel reviews. And uh, they have put up uh, a hackathon web page for it explaining what this API and how to use those APIs. So uh, as a part of this hackathon, developers would come and use those APIs. It's not mandatory for them to use only Expedia-based uh, APIs. They could basically use Facebook, Twitter, and then use one of these APIs and basically create an app. And at the end of this uh, three-day event, like uh, what we'll have is uh, they are uh, uh, going to present these their apps uh, to the judges, and then based on that, there are a bunch of prizes. Uh, I'll go through a list of prizes. Like first prize is five thousand dollars Amazon gift card and hundred K Expedia rewards points, uh, and then others are including like second prize is like two thousand Amazon two thousand dollars Amazon gift card and hundred K. Expedia rewards point. So, good, very good prices. And generally, what it does is like what judging criteria uh, is picked up is basically implementation completeness. Like, once you develop your app, is it complete or not? Is it half baked or is done very nicely? Other thing is innovation and creativity. How how innovative you are in using those APIs or you your app uh, and Third is what business value is going to add maybe to Expedia or to just uh, whosoever uses that app. And finally, the fourth criteria is like application to travel industry. Of course, Expedia is a travel uh, company, and your app is how relevant it to to travel industry. So those are uh, pretty much four judging criteria where um, uh, the apps would be uh, judged by. So uh, we are we received around 350 registrations uh, so far, and our capacity is just 200. <laughs> so it would be mostly first come first serve basis. Um, then uh, as as a volunteer, I'm volunteering in the registration part, which is like today, where you know we need to help. Uh, Set up some uh, machines so that you know when the developers come, they know they need to have a registration API, the key, and all the formalities like signing up, verifying whether they are um, actually registered, getting their group together, finding a spot for them, getting the name uh, registered, getting handling them the swags and other stuff. So today would be a generally a very busy day. So. Yeah, I'm looking forward for it. Uh, that's it from my side. Oh, okay, that was excellent. So, so you, you, let me just make a, a mm -hmm. comment before we move on to uh, our, our next segment. So, uh, uh, Atul and Julie, the speech that you gave are are excellent because what what it should do is uh, it should make somebody say, "I want to know more." Mm -hmm. And both of you did that. So, as far as my criteria, because see, mine there's nothing more to go beyond what. Mine was just an experience. That was it. There's not going to be another storm, so I can't go any further than that. There's not much more to tell. It'd be more about like, okay, is your wife okay with you now or what? So I mean, there's not much I can do with that, right? It was like this is what happened, and that's it. Yours is like a continuing thing. There's a continuation there. So one thing that I would suggest is that uh, when you get a chance, look at what you just gave, because your speech was excellent. What you communicated, right? You gave us a lot of information there. I would say that when you go to the event, uh, either make notes mm -hmm. or even record it and share us what your experience was. And you can either do that as a three-minute segment or do it as a separate uh, speech altogether mm -hmm. and expand on what you just did. Like a lot of people may not know what Hackathon is. Mm -hmm. so I'm just giving you an idea because you can do more here. So you yeah. can like part of your... Uh, Repertoire, right? Mm -hmm. That as a as a thought leader, that you're going to explain what hackathon is, and then you're going to give a specific example of your uh, this particular hackathon that you're going to be participating in, and then you can talk about the the experience that people had. Go talk to people mm -hmm. and kind of act like a reporter. Okay. Act like a journalist that you're going there as a reporter and you're going to t explain to people who may not know what a hackathon is and then you can give us your opinion on you know what are the good things what are the bad things what could be done better etc and what others can get out of it so that in the future like if i wanted to do a hackathon how mm -hmm. i can prepare for it 
uh, what language do I need to know? So give me as much info. I don't think this can be a three-minute segment, so you may want to take this and turn it into an informative speech. That's what I would recommend. Okay. Great. It's a good opportunity for you because everything you're going to do here is something you're going to be familiar with. Yes, yes. Right? So there's a that, that's something that I'm going to give you as a homework to do. Perfect. Uh, Julie, do you have any comments uh, on, on that? You know what? I think that would be really cool if you do something mm -hmm. and then share it with uh, maybe uh, the other volunteers. Nice. Um, that would be cool. Maybe you can even get a quote from them. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, so Atul, here's I, the I thing. I just think it's a great idea. Yeah, so Atul, after you do that, after you do that a speech and then, uh, you know, we can review it and then we can, then you want to send that out to your colleagues and everybody as a way of like saying, hey, listen, here's something I put on a YouTube as a way to, because uh, this is a public event, right? This is not right. some private event. So that way you can establish yourself as a thought leader among your colleagues yes. and also within the yes. company. So okay. if you have like a camera or something, you have like an iPhone or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Take pictures. Okay. Take okay. pictures, and if you can, uh, if you want to, like I said, act like a journalist, even get quotes. Okay. That, that that would be so cool. In so fact, that way you can turn it maybe into like. Maybe you can even get it put into a community newspaper. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's since yeah. you have it all done, you know. Okay. Yeah, if you want to do that. Right now, I was just thinking about doing it for yourself. Like, this is something that you're going to put on a YouTube and explain to people what a hackathon is. So you come across as a person who really would be the go-to person next time there's a hackathon, then something, somebody within the company would say, wow, look at Atul. He went in above, uh, above and beyond what every, anybody else did. So this is how you – it's a high stakes. There, this is a high stakes situation that you're going to create for yourself. Okay, let me go and try it. Right, yeah, go, go it it's not it's not high stake. It's high opportunity. High. There's okay. there's not not that much. Well, I guess that's it's high stakes in the sense it's high opportunity, but there's no high risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that that's probably the better word. High opportunity because you can't lose anything here. Right. But there's an right. opportunity to gain. Yeah. So I think Julie's right. This is not a high stakes because you're not giving a speech or you're not getting involved where you could get a job or something like that. So I think she's right. This is a high opportunity. There you go. Julie, that's a good, uh, good, good, yeah, good feedback. You know what? I think a, a stakes is risks and opportunity. In this case, there's no risks and there's great opportunity. And that we should always take a um, step up for the high opportunity, low risks. I see. That's my strategy. Right. All right, so right, I'm, I'm so it's although it's a two-day event, but I'm just going for two days for registration because I'm in that committee. Tomorrow and the after tomorrow I'm not. So I You may want to go tomorrow. <laughs> you may want to show yeah. up and say, since you're doing the reporting now, you may want to go there and act like, uh, okay, I'm going to really get more out of this and turn it into a little mini project for yourself. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just at the end, you know, get the winners and get their comments. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Yeah, tell them. Yeah, tell them. Like, by the way, uh, you're a tool. I, 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 I'm go I do the show. Uh, I'm going to record this, and I wanted to get your your experience. Like, find out their experience. You know, good, bad, or ugly, whatever. And uh, would they do it again? Like, they come up with that ultimate question. <laughs> the okay. ultimate question. They recommend. Uh, uh, have, uh, do they recommend somebody doing this for uh, uh, participating in this uh, uh, hackathon in the future? And that would be so. Go with the preparation. I think there's a good opportunity for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me try because we had some other their friends meeting there, like get together around Sunday, and so that's why I was not able to. Oh, up. that's okay. Right. That's right. Well, in the future, I'm just saying that these are all these opportunities that yeah. you have, and if you just dismiss it as like I'll just do what. I volunteered for, then you yeah. could be missing out because this is like Julie said. Julie's yeah. absolutely right. I misspoke there. This is not a high stakes as far as you can end up losing something, but it is definitely an opportunity that you're creating for yourself because yeah. nobody's asking you to do it. This is something you're doing out of your on your own, and oh. that's how you create that opportunity. Mm, nice. And who knows? Maybe it could lead to something from that. <laughs> True. That's how you get noticed, by the way. Yeah. All right. Thank All right. All right. So well, good luck. Let us know. If not, then next week let us know in a three-minute segment. You know what your experience was. So at oh. least at the minimum, we'll get that from you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, uh, we're done with our three-minute uh, speech segment, and we'll move on to our segment number one. So I'll take a brief pause. Welcome to 
Speech Talk Live, episode number 33. My name is Jay Ozan, and we're moving to segment number one. And in this segment, uh, I want to talk about, uh, this is a discussion topic, on the three reasons why people are just not good at giving public speeches. And I thought about this topic, and I came up with uh, three things. One, of course, is fear. We all have it. Second is time. And the third is method. So let me just briefly go into it, and then I'll have uh, Julie and Abdul uh, chime in and what they think of it. So let's talk about the first one, fear. Now, you know, you always read these uh, surveys that uh, people uh, would rather die before they give a speech in front of uh, people. I'm not sure how true this is, but let's say it is true. And the, the reason is that people fear, and it could be true because we don't like other people staring at us, right? It scares us. It's just that's how we're wired. And that's one of the reasons why when we get to the third one, you, you have to be a little delusional when you go out and speak in front of people. You have to kind of block that completely out. So we all have fear. Fear, I think, is constant. I have fear even doing the show. There is fear. Uh, speaking to a stranger, you have fear like, oh my God, is, I'm going to get rejected or who knows. Like we all have fear. Fear is there. You can't, oh, you, you can't get rid of it. When people say they don't have fear, there are only like three reasons that I could think of. One is they don't care. Second is there is nothing, there's no stakes there, so why should they have fear? And the third is that they could be, you know, they may have some mental issues. Who knows, you know? Uh, so, so fear is not something you can say that. Oh, I'm going to try to over. Uh, I'm going to try to get rid of my fear. That's a losing battle because every situation is going to be different. Unless you're speaking to your mom all the time, then you're not going to have fear. But that's not realistic. The second one is time. Now, the time and method can help you overcome fear. That's how it works, right? And one of the things that I've noticed is that people don't realize how much time it takes to work on a speech, to give a good speech. Now, I'm talking about speech that you're going to give in front of a lot of people. The amount of time that's required is just enormous. People just don't realize how much time that is. It, it, I, I, one of the things I said in the video that I included is that uh, this Elizabeth Gilbert, I think we might have reviewed her speech on one of our show. Uh, according to Seth Godin, uh, who may have coached her, uh, she spent uh, four hours a day for three months to get ready for that speech. That's over 300 hours. That's just not realistic. I don't. I can't spend 300 hours like that for one speech. But evidently, some people who go on TED Talks spend that kind of time to get ready for that one, one speech. So you can see how much time it takes to get in front of a large audience and give a speech like that. The third is the method. A lot of people don't have a method. They just think speaking is just you put an outline together and you just kind of wing it. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but many people that I remember at work or even now don't even record themselves. They have no idea what they look like, they sound like when they're giving a speech, what kind of gestures they're using, do they look awkward? Are they like shifting their weight around? I mean, they have absolutely no idea. And then they go and give a speech, and people notice it, and it reflects poorly on their speech. And I call that, you know, winging it. Um, and then there are other things people do. They sometimes they'll get uh, try to get feedback from their friends and colleagues, uh, which is good. But the problem is that unless they really know what they're doing, and you know how to, they know how to give feedback, and you know how to receive feedback, it's not going to work. Uh, then sometimes companies say, oh, you know, we need to send you to a, a, a class. And uh, people think that's going to fix it. And it doesn't because speaking is not something you can fix taking a class. Yes, you will get some knowledge, and you will get very good knowledge. And let me tell you, speaking is not something that's been just created. It's been around. The people like Aristotle and Plato have written about this. So this is not something new that's not been around. What's what you do need to know is that it's a process. It takes a long time, and you've got to start working on it now rather than wait till the speech comes. And one of the things I've, I've now coming to a, a conclusion on this is 
it's very hard to really improve your speaking unless you raise the stakes and you have a high stakes speech that you have to give. Otherwise, you're just not going to take it seriously. There's nothing at stakes and you're not going to really pay a lot of attention to what you're doing well and not doing well. Unless you're appearing on this show, then <laughs> you know, you're going to get feedback from people like me and others and you will, but still you have to raise the stakes. And one of the things I always tell people is we put this on the YouTube. So whatever you do on this show, there are no multiple takes here. <laughs> it's raw. In fact, that's what I could, should call this uh, show, Speech Talk Live Raw. We don't edit anything. We cut out the pieces, but the Speech Talk Live show will appear as soon as I hit the start button till the hit the stop button. Everything you see is as it is. There's nothing that's edited, and that's what speaking is. You can't edit your speeches. You can edit your writing, but not your speaking. You can edit videos, but not when you are in front of an audience. You can't just say, let me stop and reword that. Does it work like that? So those are the three things. And uh, Julie, what do you think? What, what, why do you think uh, people struggle when they have to give uh, public speeches? Do you think it's a fear time method, or is there something else that I, that I, I, I missed? Um, no, I mean, when you say method and time, and, and um, probably instead of fear, maybe just psychology, I think those are great. And fear is certainly the predominant um, emotion there. I just want to say that um, you're right that fear is constant. Um, and I like to say that courage, uh, you know, you have to have courage to overcome fear. But courage is not not having the fear of getting rid of fear. But as you said, the cur fear is always there. So courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyways. Um, Definitely true, and then time, it sure does take a lot more time than I thought. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's a different way of looking at the benefits, because when you learn to speak publicly, it's not a skill just for public speaking occasion. It's, it's a, the, this is a fundamental communication skill, and it's... Um, happening constantly in your life, you know. So when you leverage that investment of time over uh, all the conversations you have, you will think, you will discover that it's an excellent investment for your time. Um, and then method, uh, I, I found, uh, Jay, your discussion of the method very, very interesting. I think you, you're really good at um, systematically breaking down things and serializing it. And I think that's a, that's a great analytical skill. Um, perhaps there's a speech there. <laughs> and finally, um, just in terms of public speaking techniques, because this is a public speaking program as well, I um, really appreciate the way you transitioned from the body of the language into the summary conclusion because you transition us with saying a very nice way, let me tie it together for you. I, I really like that phrase, so you, can, you will hear it in my speech. <laughs> and then finally, I like the way you identify the three components or the three factors again, but you transition it from negative to positive in that you started off with why people are not good, but in your summary you said by practicing and understanding the factors, you're ready for a high-stakes speech. I really like that summary, uh, so I just want to appreciate that. But that's my, um, my story today on this. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, Atul, so what do you think? Uh, you now, you know, participate in the show, and you've been taking the Coursera course, and uh, also you've been speaking at work. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think? Fear, time, and method. Perfect. I think you have nailed it down pretty much uh, accurate uh, that fear is the most uh, important thing, uh, and, of course, time and method. What I think is, like, um, uh, time and method uh, would be, like, uh, can they be like merged into a kind of say practice because time is of course the you can you can take like uh, somebody can take like two months of time to do something and somebody can just do the same thing in one week so I I think it's uh, time could be like you know it's uh, is relative so something more 
uh, could be like a practice, like how how you practice, keep on practicing. That's where um, I feel uh, after fear it could be something called as practice, where you practice to make it better. So and then it might take some time or it might take more time, but uh, taking time means basically you are practicing something. Uh, so that's what one thing I um, uh, maybe not exactly related uh, to time, but could practice be uh, replacing time or maybe add it to one of those two or three, thing, three things which you said. Uh, from the, I agree with Julie, like how you put your, uh, Positive, so started with negative and then ended with positive part. It's uh, uh, it's motivating also. Like something you know, at the end, people love to have something you know positive or something uh, uh, good at the end to make uh, things better. So I like that thing too. Um, but yeah, overall, great, uh, Jay. Uh, I think you got it pretty much right. Yes. Yeah. So th 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 thanks a lot, Atul. Yeah. So the thing, uh, uh, and again, this is kind of uh, general, right? I, it, because to go into specific would take uh, the, even like the method would take uh, take a long time. Uh, the thing I'm talking about time is that uh, just letting people know that there is a time factor here because remember the fear, like is, if you agree that fear is constant and it should be constant, right? Because if you don't have fear then it's like you, you, you're not talking to your grandma all the time. You shouldn't have fear talking to your grandma unless your grandma happens to be really mean, which is not never the case. But, uh, but, but the thing is that the, the time will depend on the stakes that you're dealing with. And also what uh, Julie said, that the opportunity. If the opportunity isn't there, then why would you prepare? So that's why you'll always have to look for it. Like, wh is there an opportunity? Is there a, a, a stakes here? That's how you'll the, the time factor comes in, how much time you will put into that, right? And then the method is there so that you're optimizing that time. Because if you're, because what Ted does is, and this is what I've noticed, that a lot of the people that Ted, this is a profile of Ted. Let's say you have an amazing story. Like Julie's got an amazing story. She comes from Hong Kong, China, Hong Kong. So she can. Ted would probably be interested in uh, having having her give a speech. Okay, and then they take these people and they just train them for the next three months, and then they go out and give a speech. So they spend a lot of time. They put in a lot of time. Now most of the like you're you're at work. You work at Expedia. They're not. You you can't just take away three months of your time to give one speech at Expedia. That's just not practical, right? So what I'm saying is that you need to work on that method right now. And it may take, like this Coursera course is a way to learn about public speaking. So in the future when you have to give, that's why I was saying that this uh, hackathon speech that you could be working on would be part of your uh, learning the method, applying the method, so that in the future so what you're doing here is you're taking the method that you'd be learning like an informative speech and applying it to this context of hackathon. So in the future when the stakes are high, the method is already there. The time part is the, the that will increase based on the stakes. So that was the, the the whole point. I just want to make it sure it maybe not have come out that clearly. And and that's how so I don't want people to think like okay there's a time it's kind of nebulous. It's not that nebulous. It's very, like you said, it, it's it's variable, but it depends on the method also. Uh, Julie, any 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 closing thoughts? Atul, any uh, any closing thoughts, Atul? Very good. Okay, so in that case, we'll wrap this uh, up and we'll move on to uh, take a pause and move on to our next segment. Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 33. My name is Jay Oza, and we're moving to segment number two. And this is a recurring theme that uh, we seem to bring up quite a bit, and it has to do with uh, feedback. And feedback is very important. When, you, when you're giving a speech, you want to receive feedback. And also, at times, you may have to give feedback, but they kind of go together. I don't think you can just be good at giving if you're not good at receiving. So feedback is both. <clears throat> you cannot just go to a person who just gives you feedback. 
that person also should be able to receive feedback. Otherwise, I'm not sure how good a feedback that person is going to be able to give you. So I was trying to come up with something to explain people, like what's a good way to do that. And, and feedback is a very tricky thing. <clears throat> like, for example, if I go to uh, Julie and saying, Julie, so what did you think of my speech? Even though I'm asking that question, uh, you, you shouldn't give... You really shouldn't give, the, even though I'm asking, I'm giving her the permission, but you still should not give, like, oh, Jay, uh, I like the speech, but you could have, you should do this, 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 like that, like something like that. You got to be very careful. Feedback is, by the way, time consuming, okay? And she would be right because she wants to help me. At least that's what she's saying, that I want to help Jay. But most likely, I'm not going to receive it that well because if she just figured out something, I am going to say, oh, damn it, you know, how come I didn't figure that out? You know, like, it, it's, it's one of those things where you want to be helped, but you don't want to be helped that directly, right? You want to be able to, it's like when people say, people don't like to, uh, people don't like to be sold, they like to buy. That's the same concept when it comes to feedback. You want to buy, you don't want to be sold. The question is, how do you do it, right? How do you do it? What, what kind of language do you use? So I said, okay, you got to use the language that an optometrist uses. If you ever gone for your eye examination, and Atul looks like uh, Atul is gone. Oh, uh, <laughs> Atul is gone. I was like staring at the camera. Uh, so if you go for an eye examination, and Julie, you've been to an eye examination, right? Where the optometrist will put on that I forgot what they that unit they call, and they'll keep adjusting the prescription and ask you, you know. Is this better or this better, this better, or this better? They can't determine which is the one that's going to make you see better. They can give you some idea, but at the end, you've got to tell him, yes, this is the one where I'm seeing better from this eye, and this is the one that you adjusted is what's making me see better. And then, boom, suddenly you, he writes down the prescription, and you now got a 20-20 vision or as best as you can possibly get. And that's the kind of – that's – that's the process that you have to use when you're giving a feedback. You've got to be in the mode of an optometrist or an ophthalmologist in adjusting the vision and saying, try this, try that, try this, try that. Now, this is, <clears throat> of course, with vision, it's easy. But with giving a feedback for speech, it's time consuming. That's why you have to be careful. Who do you ask? If that person is not going to sit down and work with you like that, most likely you're not going to receive it. And in fact, you may end up resenting that person for coming up with something because that's it, it, just telling you something is not something you're going to be able to do. That person is going to have to make you tell them, yes, I think those are two things. Let me see. Try this or try that. Which one works better? And then you come up with it. So then you feel like you own it. You, div you came up with it and you own it. Uh, Julie, what do you think? You give a lot of feedback. So uh, well, what is your approach? Yeah, Jay, I really like, um, I think I, I did a lot of commentary on this one. I really like um, uh, your idea of like kind of feel it out. It's like a dance kind of thing. And um, yeah, some people think that they're being honest when they just shit, like do a core dump. But even in programming, you don't do a core dump, you know. You want to... Um, you want to figure out what the person's really looking for, and you want to figure out what the person's, um, how much they can take, right? Uh, because psycholo psychological study says you need three to five positives for one negative to maintain positive relationship. So I, I generally start with, as you said, there's two ways I started. Sometimes I start with, uh, depending on my level of uh, knowledge and relationship with that person, I may just say a little bit and see how they take it, um, which is parallels your way of doing introductions too. I'll go into a little bit more. Um, the other thing is I'll just ask, what kind of feedbacks do you want? Do you want me to look at your body language? Do you want me to look at your content? Um, you know, how much time do you want me to give you feedback? If someone says, I only have two minutes, you know, I know I'm not going to do too much. So, yes, um, because when you go into an optometrist, you, are, you already know what the goal is. I think in when people solicit feedback, I need to establish the goal. So that's a pre-step to optometry. And... Um, 
Here, one of the points that really stuck out to me is that the person could become resentful and um, maybe envious because you said, like, why would you figure out and why didn't I figure out? So that's a relational thing, right? If your boss comes to you and asks you, you don't want to give him everything and make him feel bad. On the other hand, you want to support him. So it's a fine line. So finally, uh, going back to um, what I said earlier, that I really like the way you approach everything, like even in, in helping me doing the coach in your coaching me in the speech uh, I am trying to give and in your talks about going through different levels of introduction there's always you always have an incremental approach and you always have like checkpoints in between to say um, is this person continually interested uh, should I go up to the next level and I think that's a really nice strategy um, Finally, I think because of the way the feedback goes, I think there's a fine line between feedback, coaching, and instructions. As you go deeper into the feedback, you actually provide, you're providing uh, knowledge and information in a way that may be instructional for them, right? So that, that's an interesting exploration. Um, And uh, yeah, I think even in a job interview that you, you you were talking about in networking events, you always use that incremental approach. So I call that incremental refinement and enrichment. Um, the strategy of incremental refinement and enrichment, which is you develop. Um, also like your nice transition uh, into the summary, and I like your ending statement. Yes, I can see clearly now because that is a very culturally meaningful statement and has emotional appeal and it implies the process of going from not being able to see to being able to see. So it fits really well into the optometrist metaphor that you were using. So that's my story for today here. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for the, uh, the, the feedback. Um, and I'd like to ask you a question here, and it has to do with um, that when somebody asks you for a feedback, should because this is what I was thinking that if you're talking more, then that means that that feedback is probably not going to be your job is to is to get the other person to talk about you can only suggest things like okay uh, let's try these two things and the other thing oh yeah this is another thing so that's one thing so keep a, a note that down like how much should you be talking and what kind of language you should be using so that you're not talking too much but you're saying uh, let's see there are two things that uh, there's one thing you're doing but there's another thing you're doing which one do you like like that like, like exactly what an optometrist would do do you see better with this or do you see better with this? Do you see better with this? Do you see better with this? So there should always be two things. So the person gets to make the decision. You shouldn't be making the decision for the person. The second thing is this is something that I just learned when I was uh, listening to, I think the guy's name is uh, Marshall Goldsmith. I think he wrote a book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There or something like that. And I saw him on one uh, show where he said that, uh, let's say an employee goes to a manager about something. And the manager says, okay, to make it better by like, say he makes some suggestion like, oh, why don't you do this? Or like, why don't you change this wording to this? And that might make it, he gave some number, incremental, he gave some number. It might make it like 5% better. But then he said what he, that's true. It might make it better a little bit, but then that person will now lose that motivation by 50% because now suddenly that person, he didn't use the word like he'll be jealous, but it's the, I think he was saying the same thing that I, I, I picked up from another book that, so the manager, let's say you are my manager. I come to you and say, Julie, what do you think of my speech? And he said, Jay, you know, I, I like your speech, but uh, I think you need to move a little bit more. That may make the speech, uh, maybe 10% better, but then 
I may lose the motivation completely and that may drop to like 50%. So the question is, if it's just improving by a little bit, it may not even be worth mentioning it. That's why I always use this formula that I call it the 60, 30, 10. If you're gonna make the first thing that you say or the first thing you wanna target has to make the improvement, it's gotta be weighted at 60%. And the second thing has to be weighted at 30%. And third, if you think it's necessary, it's 10%. Because remember, no speeches are perfect. And after three, it's not even relevant because you can't make that many changes to anything. So the top one you got to, the first one you pick has to be making a big improvement. Otherwise, don't mention it because otherwise what you're going to do is that person, instead of making the speech better, his motivation could drop substantially. Now, there may be some research here that explains this better, but it's something that I was thinking about, that when you give a feedback, you have to use that calculation that when you say something, what are the consequences of is, is the you know you have to weigh it i guess that's what i'm thinking the, the improvement versus what that person could be losing you have to kind of balance that because it might improve it a little bit but what does he lose when you improve it a little bit anyway you may have a better way of uh, wording that uh, you want to give some uh, what, do, what do you think of that oh sorry i forgot to uh, mute um yeah this is a very interesting topic because um when I'm in a when I'm facilitating a workshop and I'm in a leadership role, I really try to be not charismatic because I don't want people to project what they think is successful or high ability onto me. So actually when you become like you always say in speeches, you don't want you want people to learn something. More than that, I think what you're saying here is, well, I don't know if that's what you're saying, but this is what I'm taking, is I want people to feel better about themselves, to have a sense of confidence about their ability. So if you come off as too smart, uh, two things could happen. They could, they could lose their power. They could lose their power two ways. They can lose their power by resentment, thinking you're better than they are and you have taken their power away. But they can also lose their power by projection. Like, oh, Jay is such a wonderful speaker. I really, I will never be like Jay. You know, instead of saying, hey, man, I'm a pretty good speaker and I just learned something from Jay. I can be a better speaker. Um, I... I do, I'm very sensitive to that. So uh, what I do is I not only give people choices, I always affirm them and I affirm the skills that they already have before I add an incremental skill. And so, yeah, I do let people speak a lot. In fact, I just came out of a coaching section and I, I, um, I think she spoke 80% of the time. But the 20% I do speak, you're right, I have to make sure it's really to the point and it's really important because otherwise I won't be able to substantially shift anything. So there's, there's a lot of um, time and attention and space in creating this trust, right, before they're ready to shift in any behavior. So I think you're talking about that as well. I mean, that's that's how I take care of it. Oh, yeah, and, 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 there, and there's a, an, another point uh, that that I was asking you about. Uh, it's like, do you weigh the pluses and minuses? I mean, do you use what kind of calculation do you use? For example, saying, okay, you know what? Like, for example, let's say I, I gave a speech, and uh, you you like the main. Like I said, you got to know what the the main parts of it is that are important. And now you're focusing on something that could be improved, okay? That could be improved, but I haven't asked for it. But by bringing that up, like, you could be showing, look how smart I am. Like, I picked up something, uh, like it could be body language, okay? But in its totality, it may not be that important, right? Because your message was clear, you were passionate, all of those things that made the speech good. At that point, do you you could bring it up, 
this is where good coaches and bad coaches make a difference because you look you 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 calculate and say you know what i could bring it up and that would make the speech better but then what else what are the consequences because everything that's positive cannot just be positive there's also something you lose along the way too and suddenly you just now pointed out something that may increase my speech a little bit but then suddenly i lost some confidence in the process saying oh my god uh, she just pointed this thing out you have to look at how i feel about it right and and that's that's a very hard i don't even know if i'm expressing this clearly but that's something that when you're giving a feedback you do have to think about that at what point do you stop if you if something major is wrong like for example when you and i were having a coaching session i said the main message if that's like if there if you can get the audience into your story then the message isn't going to get through that's a main thing i can't just ignore that but if you were like certain else that's not a major part of it that's like not the top 3 or uh, like i said the 60% there's a 30% there's a 10% if it's down at the 10% level that the speech could improve by 10% then i may just decide not to mention that because that's not that important because by bringing that up i have no idea how that could affect you as a person and that's what i was trying to get to that that's something that we do have to think about when we are giving feedback that uh, you hone in on the main thing but then minor things you may want to let go because then the person is not going to react well to those minor things and it may not make the speech that much better in its totality uh, yeah i mean I, I think i was trying to say that but maybe i need to say it differently is i first of all let the person talk a lot so i know what's important to them so i'm both i'm both the person expert i know what this person not wants and I'm also the subject expert okay so at any one time you have very little opportunity in my coaching sections I'm not dealing with public speaking right I'm dealing with people's visions and their livelihoods right so they bring in like a, a, a lot of heavy issues right so I have to I, I, I will never solve all their problems all I can do is kind of change the direction a little bit, the bow, and hopefully the destination, they'll get to the destination um, in, in the right time, right? So it's not even the, you know, they talk about the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the staff will affect 80% of whatever's going on. It's really the 90-10 rule or the 595 rule. You really have to get into the core issue and just focus on that. So that's how I do it. I hope that I answered that question. Yeah, no, I think I think you did. And I, I mean, we're just having a discussion. I mean, this could go on for a while, but at this thing, at this point, we'll just uh, wrap this up and say that uh, feedback is tricky. You have to really think about just like you have to prepare ahead of time and somebody asks you feedback like randomly, like, Hey, what do you think of this? Don't fall into the trap. I'll just give you a, a humorous example. I think I might have said this. Uh, I was on a plane, and there were these uh, 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 a young woman and her mother. They were they were sitting next to me, and uh, this this young they were from Ireland. I don't know. They're from England, I believe. England or I Ireland, I think. And uh, the mother looked. Uh, she was in bad shape. Uh, she had a breathing apparatus, and the the, the daughter was bringing her to Disney World. Um, it's a money that they had saved because she doesn't think that her mother's gonna. She's got all kinds of uh, lung lung related issue. I forgot the word. There, there's a lung disease or something. <clears throat> and uh, and middle of the flight, this young woman asked me, so like in an, an Irish accent, you know, how old do you think my mom is? And I'm like, oh my god, this is a <laughs> this is a question you definitely don't want to be asked. And the worst is you can't be stupid enough to even answer this. But I was stupid, <laughs> and I said, um, "I think she's probably first of all, I'm in my fifties, okay? So I, I think I'm in my twenties. <laughs> I don't know why." <laughs> so I said, "I think your mom looks like a young 
like I said, uh, uh, someone that probably she's probably much younger than she is. I would say she's in her mid to late 60s. And as it turned out, she wasn't in her mid to late 60s. She was in her early 60s. And I felt so bad afterwards. I said, never, ever answer that question. <laughs> you should just say, I can't, I have bad eyesight. I can't tell. <laughs> But don't. Well, you can say she looks great. <laughs> she looks great. I don't care what age she is. She looks great. That's that's a better answer. I don't know. I was kind of put on the spot, and I felt so bad afterwards. I was like, when I for the rest of the flight, I was like, I hope they don't throw me off the plane. <laughs> I mean, she's got this breathing apparatus. I said, I hope uh, she doesn't. Uh, but anyway, I don't think they took it badly. I said, look, I'm just terrible at picking out age since you asked that, to be honest. But don't be honest when it comes to giving people's age. OK, so we'll take a pause and start our next uh, 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 segment. And uh, just put your thing on mute so I can. Sorry about that. OK, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 33. My name is Jay Oza, and uh, this is segment number three. And this is something eh, you may think it's a little controversial. And this has to do with uh, when you are giving a speech. And a lot of times when you're giving a speech, you're giving a speech because you have some kind of something to say, something that not everybody's going to like, everybody's going to agree with, but you still have to say it. Or you could just say, you know what? Everybody doesn't agree with this. So I'm not going to say it, which is not going to help you. OK, because no speech that you ever give, unless you're preaching to a choir, uh, people out there are going to not agree with you or may not like you or there's those things you have no control over. So I, I said to myself that when I look at these people that are speaking, take anybody that is famous speakers, you have to be a little delusional because the thinking is that you know that there are people out there that don't agree with you, but you're still going to say it. And, you know, whether you are a politician, which we know are definitely, they're not a little delusional. Some of them could be really delusional. Okay. And then you look at uh, people in marketing, definitely delusional because they promise things that they know that they were going to work. But as long as they think it, that's good enough, right? I think that's delusional to an ex extent. Then you have uh, uh, coaches. So anytime you're thinking about a future, there is that uncertainty that allows you to get away with being delusional. And sometimes with politicians, the problem is they're delusional even if there's a proof there that completely contradicts everything they're saying, but they still act like it doesn't even exist. So I'll give you an example, like climate change. <clears throat> if there are 100 scientists say there's, there's a, uh, there are 100 scientists, if 98 of them say that there is definitely, Earth is getting warmer, and there are two out there that are saying, well, I'm still not convinced. People who don't believe in it will latch on to those two. That, in my opinion, is delusional because the overwhelming proof is that there is a climate changes, there's change taking place, but they're latching on to these two for whatever reason, for their political agenda or whatever. And a lot of times, people who are delusional, are t they tend to be very powerful speakers. I mean, you go through history, you look at Adolf Hitler, you look at anybody, you have to convince people because the future is uncertain. You have to get them to see the future that you want them to see. And not what they're seeing right now, it's what they're going to see. So anytime you see a politician or a coach, uh, a football, a sports coach or a motivational speaker or a businessman or a marketer, they have to be a little delusional. So what I'm saying with this thing is that if you're giving a speech, you have to ask yourself, you know, are you being a little delusional or not? If somebody says, like, uh, if I ask uh, Julie, said, Jay, you know, that's a good topic, but I think there's some little bit of delusion there that this is what people are going to agree to. I think that's a compliment because that means that you are going to target the few people who think like you, and that's all you can do, right? The others are never going to agree with you, but if you if you get talked out of it. That's the worst thing that can happen, right? Because that's what then you would never have Steve Jobs uh, developing an iPhone or a, a Mac or anything. There has to be that element of delusionality, if that is a word, in order for you to be that powerful speaker to get other people to believe. So I just wanted to have a discussion on this that uh, 
you know, what do you think of this? Is this uh, something that you have to take into account when you're giving a speech that it, it should be a little bit delusional? Otherwise, why are you giving it if everybody already is agreeing with you? So Julie, what do, what do you think about this? Uh, you have some thoughts on this. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, so um, the, key, the, two, the, the two key concepts that I got out of your speech, where I, which I totally agree with, is uh, be passionate. Be passionate about whatever you're speaking about. And the second one is um, crazy wisdom, stepping outside of common sense. Uh, Trumpa Rinpoche um, was a very famous Buddhist teacher who came from uh, Tibet to England then to America. Um, so in that sense, I think I think you said something like, if you really believe it, then it's okay. Um, this whole idea of being delusional and being a visionary, it's a tricky subject for me. So I, I would say, like when you say the future is uncertain, you want the audience to see your future, I think that's being visionary. Um, some people might call your vision delusional. But the word delusional doesn't sit well with me. Just, I mean, I, I, you, I know you did it for controversy because it implies not connected with reality. That um, doesn't have any basis of reality. In fact, if you have a vision, that vision is not have any connection with reality. So um, people may call you delusional. I, I don't know if you have to be truly divisional, delusional. I think you have to be passionate and you have to be sincere about your vision. So you have to be maybe a visionary. Uh, the other thing is, I you have said that maybe Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump really believe what they're saying, um, or the marketing people. I think that there is a there's an ethical question there. That if you don't really believe it and you're saying it, then you're not being, whether you're delusional or not is not the point. I think the fundamental issue there is you, you're already lacking integrity. Um, however, um, I do believe what you said, that you said that sometimes delusional people are like very powerful speakers because and I add this is um, they can be very persuasive because they are so locked into their reality. Um, I think what you're saying at the end is right. As long as you believe it and you have evidence, go for it. You know, and then you say coaches, motivational speakers, and CEOs. I agree with you. They they sometimes present a reality that is not common sense reality. So in that sense, they're taking people out of our rea common sense reality into an alternate uh, universe of things. And that I think, if that's what you mean by delusional, then I will agree with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> okay, so let me explain. <clears throat> I think uh, delusional is a mental illness. But when I say little delusional, what I'm saying is that if there is even a slight possibility that it could be true what you're saying, and you go with it, right? Like, for, for example, uh, like I gave an example like a, a coach telling the team, yes, you're going to win, you're going to win, because realistically they haven't played the game. So when the score is 0-0, zero, zero, yeah, of course, <laughs> anything can happen, right? Like they say in football, on any given Sunday, any team can beat any other team, right? So the, what is the coach going to say? Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Your chances of winning this game are practically zero. But go out and have fun. <laughs> the coach is going to get fired if he did that, right? Or goes to the owner. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, let me just give you your chances of 
doing well this year are terrible. We have a terrible quarterback. We have a terrible coaches. We have terrible players. We'll be lucky if we win one game again this year. I don't think people like to hear that. So part of it is we like to listen to delusional people because <laughs> like, like you remember that famous speech that, uh, that, that an Animal House, uh, Bluto is it, that uh, played by John Belushi gives when they were like all beaten down. And he says, you know, uh, when the Germans attacked Pearl Harbor, I mean, he was just going on and on. And the people, one of the fraternity members says, let him go. He's on a roll. <laughs> let him say it. And he gets the team all motivated. <laughs> Are we going to end our college life like this? That's a great speech, actually. <laughs> if, you, if you ever watch that, you can watch it. Uh, you can do a search on YouTube. And uh, completely delusional. But you know what? People, people are captivated by other people that are delusional. Like I think uh, Donald Trump is delusional. I think Bernie Sanders is. All politicians, in a sense, who are running for president are delusional, right? Otherwise, who would be stupid enough to do that and promise things that they know they can never deliver? Uh, Donald Trump wants to make America great again. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> make America some? I think America is already great. Like, what does that mean that America is going to make America great again? That means we have to be really sucking bad right now for him to do that. So that's a delusional talk right there. But people like it. People are are attracted to people that are that uh, that are delusional. I mean, that's how Hitler became uh, the, the chancellor of uh, the, the Fuhrer of, of Germany, because he just created this delusion that Germany was going to create this, the Third Reich and all of that. And after a while, people said, wow, you know, this guy sounds like he could do it. Yeah, I'm for it, you know, and that's what happens. So that's, that's, uh, so what I'm saying is that if somebody says to you, uh, Julie, guess what? There is no, I mean, this is where it gets a little sickness, right? Where people said, Julie, guess what? Uh, these people who think there's somebody coming uh somebody's gonna come from spaceship and take us away that at that point is not delusional that becomes a mental illness because that is just no evidence that it can ever happen right that has never happened in the past and it's never going to happen in the future that is a mental illness at that point but if somebody says that oh climate change there's one scientist out there that doesn't believe in it at that point you can get away with it because if there's that one scientist you can cite as an example even though what you're saying is completely delusional, but nobody's going to put you in a mental hospital because you can point to that one scientist. <laughs> hey, there's that one scientist. Like Just like what uh, Donald Trump's saying, I can build a wall. Well, it's delusional, but you know, realistically, the guy is a builder. Building a wall isn't that difficult, even though it's totally impractical and it's delusional because wall isn't going to accomplish anything. I mean, they got that Great Wall of China. I don't know what that's preventing people from you know, doing right now. It's just a nice thing that you can see and visit. It's a tourist attraction. So if he wants to make a, 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 a Trump a wall to kind of compete with the Great Wall of China, it could become a tourist attraction. That's all it's going to be. It's not going to achieve its objective. So th that's what I'm trying to point out, that in a speech, don't try to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, because that's not what a speech is. A speech is supposed to get people kind of riled up one way or the other. And if it's just kind of not doing that, then I'm not sure what that, because this is in rela relation to, this is a much broader topic, and I think we're kind of taking it a little bit far, but I'm saying when you're giving a speech, how far should you kind of traverse, it's a risk factor, right? Like how much risk should you be taking, or should you just keep it very tight and give a real boring speech without using any, without kind of being a little bit outside the, the 40 yards, right? And, and that's what I'm getting down to, that when you start doing that, then the speech gets a little bit, you kind of get painted as a little dip. Some people will say, who are really narrow and tight in their thinking are gonna say, hey, you know, that Jane and Julie, they're a little delusional in their, what they were saying about public speaking. You can't just make people into a great public speaker. I mean, that could happen to you. you you're coaching people, right, with helping them. At some point, you have to see the future that there's a possibility. Is it going to happen? Are you going to be held accountable for it? Probably not. And that's what I consider as a little bit, you know, delusional. Anyway, your turn. Well, I, I, I see that you're very excited about the topic, so good for you. <laughs> um, I would just say that as a personal speaker, that first of all, even in society, there's a range of degree of... Um, how far you can stretch, right? So, um, 
scientists have to follow the scientific method. So if they want to be accepted in that community, they probably don't want to be delusional, right? But however, when you take someone like Martin Luther King Jr. and he says, I have a dream, that's not common sense everyday reality, right? So do you call him a visionary or do you call him um, a delusional? And I'm sure there's people on the other side, and I don't know uh, who they are, maybe the Daughters of America, who has a dream too, <laughs> but their dream is a little different than um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, right? And so, yeah, I think you're right. That, um, what you, even the question of what is delusional, there is a social context and there is the community that you're speaking to, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a, I, 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 if, you're, if you're giving advice to all the students on Coursera or you're going to coach, I think this question of how visionary or how delusional to be has to be modulated, right, with the context of who you're speaking to, what you're speaking about. But what's unquestionable is the passion that you want to make sure is there, right? And your own sense of faith in what you're saying. That is um, no matter what speech you go and giving. So if I look at the word delusional, I think there's a question of passion, there's a question of vision, there's a question of social acceptability, and those are different parameters that you engage in when you say you have to be a little delusional. So some things more than others in the context that it's in. So that's that's my answer. <laughs> that's yeah, my no, that's point. A good, yeah. good point. I, I think the way uh, I don't know whether you agree. I think like let's say if people agree with you, then you're a visionary. If they don't agree with you, then you're delusional. So if I tell people that, uh, like like it's, see, if somebody comes to me and wants to improve their public speaking, but right away, they're coming to me. That means I know that they have certain things. This is how people get conned, right? This is how you get manipulated. Like when you go to a store, the store has a big advantage over you because you took the effort to get to the store, even though you're not thinking that way, right? You're bringing your wallet, you're coming to the store with your body and your mind into that store. For you to now walk out not buying something is really going to be hard. That's why you know malls like people coming to the mall. Once you're there, then they just nickel and dime you to death. And that happens at concerts all the time. I don't know if you've been to any concert or any games. The ticket you buy has already been discounted. That's already been paid for. Now they try to upsell on stuff. And before you know it, a simple game or, or, or it turns into a major expense, like uh, whether it's Broadway or anything. and. Uh, and, and and that's and that's what I'm saying. That if you came there, that means you already are sold, and now you're just going to keep buying, 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 right? Then that's what makes you, you know, a visionary. But if you never go, you're like, I'm never going to this game because I know exactly I, I'm not going to. I can watch it on TV. I can get the score on internet. Why do I want to give up? If you're thinking like that, and somebody says, Oh, you got to go to the game. You're going to have a great time. I'll think you're delusional, man. That's not going to happen. I know it because I've been there before. Anyway. I think uh, we've covered this uh, quite well. So let me just at this point uh, close this uh, show. Uh, any closing comments before I close it? Yeah, no, great. Thanks for putting all this together. Very nice uh, topics. Appreciate it. Thank let me you. close this out. So again, thank you all. Thank you, Julie, for uh, joining today and Atul for, for joining. And for those who are watching it at, this, uh, at the end here, I want to say one thing that Public speaking is an everyday thing. It's not it's not something you can just uh, wait till you have to give a high stakes speeches. Like I said, one of the things we talked about is the method. The method is something you start working on it, like Julie and I are doing. This is part of our method. Doing the show is our way of working on our method. This is like not method acting, it's method speaking, I guess. That's what you can make. I mean, maybe we just coined a new word here, method speaking. And at the end, remember one thing, you are how you speak. So keep working on it and keep getting better every day. And at this point, we're going to wrap this show up. Thank you. All right, Julie. So uh, so let's get into the miscellaneous talk. You, you had some uh, 
uh, uh, topics that you wanted to discuss, right? How much time do you have? You can unmute your you can unmute your 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 line. You know, my husband is still very sick. He's uh, bedridden, so I probably should go in about fifteen minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. And then and then if we things to pick up, then we can pick up. Um, I don't know. Do I? Do we? Ha oh, you you said that. Uh, you said that you want to talk about do uh, not doing the workshop, and that's fine. Um, so I just took your name off it. So far, I only have one student. So is there anything else we need to talk about? All right. Because uh, one of the things that uh, I, I just wanted to be uh, uh, careful about is that. Uh, uh, like anything on Coursera now, this is sort of this is for us to kind of develop our skill set when it comes to coaching and speaking and all that. Mm -hmm. But like when people want to come on, I I don't want to use up my time because we've done this now for a long time. So at this point, if they're not ready to, because if somebody came to me and said, "I want to work with you, can you help me?" The first thing I would tell them is I would not just say, "Oh well, you know," before I you know, start charging you for it, because I think my time is valuable. I think you and I know a lot where we can provide value. The question is, they would be paying us for the value, because we put in a lot of time learning the skill. But one thing I would tell them is that they, if they don't, if nothing is urgent, I mean, they don't have a high stake speech, then they should work on their method. That means that they should go through the, the Coursera course and do it on their own, like the way you and I have. And if they can do that, and then they have a high stake speech, then I'm certainly available to help them. But what I'm not going to do is kind of act as a like a motivator, like, oh, you got to take this course. Because at the end, you've got to do the speeches. <laughs> I can't do it for them, right? They have to really do the speeches. So that was that's what I was trying to say, that, uh, that at this point, you and I are in a mode where, you know, we're helping each other out. But other people, if they want to do it, they should at least finish the course and then join us and have this type of discussion and uh, and, and get the you know whatever help they need. Um, because otherwise, uh, like one of the things uh, we always talk about is the fear, right? And people have fear, and at some point, the fear is not just going to disappear by waiting and waiting. They have to take some kind of an action, doing something. So uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was. Um, so my book is coming along well. My part one, I, I'm splitting it into different parts because I don't want to get too far ahead, even though my part two is already done. So my part one, I'm going to clean it up this weekend, and I should have it to you by uh, Monday. Okay. And then I'd like your feedback. So I'd like that initial feedback. So once I send it to you, that's my first well, draft. Send me some questions. You're really good with questions. So send me some yeah, questions. Yeah, I, I think what I'll do in the beginning is I will just have you just kind of take a quick look at it, okay? Okay. And then once you say, oh, I took a quick, like just take a look at the sections and maybe read a little bit and saying, and then saying, you know, then come back to me and saying, Jay, what specific, like, yeah, you're using my method right here. What specific things that you want to me to look into now that I've gone through it with a, you know, I spent like a quick half hour and taking a look at that. What specific things do you want me to, to look at? And like, I don't want you to focus on the grammar and all that because eventually right. I'll get an editor because I went through Grammarly. The grammar and all that's not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about is like, if you were to read this, what is the main thing you're getting out of it? So think of it like you're reviewing the book like that. But the initial, initial take would be just to, look at the organization and saying, Jay, this organization could may require a little bit of, if I'm reading it, uh, I may want this to be organized this way, that way, and that would make more sense if I was reading it. So read it like, like you are somebody who's trying to learn from this book. Like, what okay. are you learning from this book? Like, give me three things that, that really, that you got out of it. That would be in more detail. So first take, I once I send it to you, spend like half hour or an hour, whatever time you have, and just give me a quick feedback that I see the, and remember, this is just the first part. The second part I can talk to you about, but any kind of help you can provide me will give me some idea on what to do with it. Okay, cool. Okay? Yeah. Anything else that you wanted to go over? Um, um, I haven't worked on my speech yet. Oh, you know what I thought we could do? Um, instead of like having Mondays to coach and then Wednesdays to talk business, 
I thought we could just have one meeting a week, and then we just rotate one week to talk business if we have any, and then one week to talk about whatever you need, which is the book, and then one week to talk about whatever I need, and you could coach me or whatever. Okay, so when do you want your next coaching session? Well, I think the next one we can talk about your book. Okay, so Wednesday we can talk about Wednesday the book. Wednesday we can talk about the book. How's uh, that? Okay, yeah. Why don't we focus on that? All right. Sounds okay. good. Okay, so I'll let you... Oh, by the way, I told you, right? Uh, I know I emailed you. I don't know if you got it or not. Um, Marius and I switched to Thursday, so Wednesday anytime is fine. Okay, sounds. Wednesday okay. is good. Right. Okay, so I'll wait for your invitation. And Oh, great. I think these are really good. I mean, hopefully that's helping you. I mean, today's speeches are, are really good. Hopefully, it's helping you to develop your coaching Yeah, practice. no, I, I think that first topic is included in my book. All these things are included in the book. That's why I needed to get some feedback from from, from you and have a discussion on it. So I get, an, I, get a different, I get a different viewpoint to think about. Right. And uh, what, what else did I wanted to say? Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, so once I have this, like I said, uh, by Monday, I will... Uh, I will I will send it to you initially as a PDF and then if you want to I can create a separate directory and give you access so you can read it online. It's up to you how you want to do it. Oh um well for the first round where a PDF is fine. If uh, in the future it'd be nice if I can make commentaries. Yeah, oh, I have to figure I, out how to do that so that way Are you a Google Doc? Is yeah. this a Google Doc? Yeah. You can just go on the share. Yeah. Put my name in, and then you can choose edit or comment. I okay. would prefer I'll, I'll, to. I'll do edit because then yeah. I'll just put a different I, color on it. In the, in the first pass, I just want you to kind of. Not give the me first a, pass. Yeah. The the first first, pass. Once I say, once you say, like, I want to, we want to figure out how to do it so that way, because I'm not good at these. I've never done this before, so I just want to make sure that it's not. I mean, I'll create a separate directory. But you can give me your feedback. Right, okay? right. You what you do is you probably create a different book, right? A different yeah, copy. a different uh, file. And yeah. Then, and then what happens is if you share that new file with me, and then what I will do is I will I will put my stuff in a different color, so then yeah. you see it right away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Sounds that's good. that's the next round anyway. Right, right. So let me just get it. Yeah. So I think what I'll do is I'll just create a separate directory and then just share it with you and send you an email. Okay, great. Rather than creating a PDF, okay? Okay, great. All right, Thank Julie, you. thanks a lot and enjoy your weekend. I hope your uh, husband is, uh, starts getting better. It looks like he is. He wobbled out, and that's why I was turning around to oh, see okay. him. Oh, okay. So. Thank right. you so yeah. much. All right, okay. Take enjoy care. your weekend. I'll see you, you next too. week. Bye. Bye.